Over time, various rectangular square infantry formations dominated the battlefields of the world. From the Macedonian phalanx, which was one pillar of Alexander the Great's success, to the Schiltron as a decisive factor in the Scottish struggle for independence, to the Spanish Dercio, the war machine helping the Habsburgs to control Europe. These formations shaped the warfare of their time decisively. In this video, we will look at some hand-picked examples, work out some of these formations' most central characteristics, and look at several of their most famous battles as well. For the sake of brevity and entertainment, we will prioritize interesting aspects over in-depth analysis. More detailed info about each formation can be found by clicking on the links in the top right corner of the screen. So, let's dive straight in. The first formation to talk about is obviously the ancient Greek phalanx. It is best known for the important role it played during the conquest of the Macedonian king Alexander the Great. As one of the pillars of his military success, the phalanx played a decisive role in several battles, such as Chaeronea, Granicus and Gaugamela. At Gaugamela, in 331 BC, Alexander faced a Persian army superior in numbers under Darius III. The Macedonians defeated the Persians by luring most of the cavalry on the Persian left flank to the side, where they managed to defeat them. This opened up a gap in the center, which the phalanges of the first line and Alexander's cavalry could exploit to decisively win the battle. The Battle of Gaugamela is considered the final blow to the Achaemenid Empire, which was then completely conquered by Alexander. The origin of the phalanx, however, begins about 300 years earlier. Beginning in the 7th century BC, it became the standard formation for armies throughout Greece. The phalanx consisted of heavily armed foot soldiers, so-called hoplites. Every soldier had to bring his own weapons and armor. The hoplites were arranged in close ranks so that they formed a shield wall, with the shield of every man covering the right side of the one standing next to him. Besides the shield, they carried spears, and secondary weapons such as daggers and swords. Usually, the phalanx was eight rows deep, while the width depended on the overall number of men. In battle, the phalanges marched towards the enemy and tried to push them away. The goal was to disrupt their battle order to gain a significant advantage. This is best shown by the fact that an army usually suffered most losses once the formation was broken up and the men turned to flight. Naturally, every man tried to get his uncovered right flank behind the shield of his neighbor. Thus, the formation had a tendency to spin to the right. If two phalanges fought, they could even rotate counterclockwise. This was even more of a problem because of the distribution of elite fighters within the formation. Traditionally, the most veteran men were at the right wing. This meant that each right wing fought the enemy's weak left wing. Whoever won on the right wing first usually ended up winning the battle. This problem of the early Greek phalanx formation was solved by the generals of Thebes in the 5th and 4th century BC. First, the right wing was deepened to 25 ranks in order to defeat the enemy's weaker side more quickly. Then, in the Battle of Leuctra, the famous general Epaminondas arrayed his troops in the so-called oblique order. This is considered one of the most important tactical developments. He inverted the traditional order by placing his best man on the left wing and deepening it to 50 ranks. Thus, when the Thebans met the Spartans on the field of Leuctra, the elites of the two armies clashed. Epaminondas's plan worked out. His left wing won the clash while his weaker center and right wing stayed back, which is the reason this order is called oblique. The next reform was implemented by the Macedonian king Philip II. He equipped his men with the famous Sarissa, a pike of 5 meters and a light shield. The Macedonian phalanx was 16 rows deep and arranged in a way that the Sarissas of the 2nd to the 5th row had their points all in front of the first line. The men further to the back held their weapons vertically and increased the pushing power of the formation. In the early days, the phalanx was almost exclusively made up by Greek Macedonian fighters. But after the 3rd century BC, the Macedonian rulers increasingly relied on mercenaries. According to the historian Leonhard Burkhardt, the Macedonian phalanx had two crucial weaknesses. Firstly, it struggled on uneven terrain and secondly, the formation was not suited for close-up melee fights. 
The long weapons that made the formation strong early on in a fight were too unwieldy in a long and extended melee battle, and the longer a battle took, the likelier it became that the formation would be disrupted. These weaknesses became obvious in the Battle of Putna in 168 BC, when the Macedonian phalanges under King Perseus met the Roman army under the experienced commander Lucius Aemilius Paulus. Both armies chose a traditional array, with the phalanges and legions respectively in the center, additional infantry beside them and cavalry on the wings. The battle began in the afternoon. At first, the Romans had difficulties to deal with the long sarissas of their enemies, and the Macedonians advanced towards the Roman camp, which is situated at the foothills of Mount Olocrus. When the phalanges entered the uneven terrain, they lost cohesion and gaps opened in their lines. Paulus immediately reacted, divided his troops and ordered them into these cracks. In close combat, the Roman legionaries specialized in close-up melee fighting quickly gained the upper hand. When the Roman cavalry on the right wing defeated the weaker Macedonian cavalry and turned towards the infantry, organized resistance became impossible. Many Macedonians were butchered where they stood. Unlike the Romans, who didn't put a lot of emphasis on long spears, other armies continued to rely on spear-armed troops. But for the next couple of centuries, it seems that, generally speaking, more linear formations were used, for example, shield walls. Let's fast forward to 13th century Scotland, where we find the next subject of study, the Shiltron. This massed infantry formation is first mentioned in accounts about the Battle of Falkirk in 1298 but it is very well possible that it was in use much earlier. The Shiltron could either be rectangular or circular. The latter was the case at Falkirk. There, the Scottish formed four circles and even reinforced them by plucking additional stakes into the ground. The outer rows then knelt with their pikes pointed towards the enemy, while the following rows placed them above their comrades. Deployed in this hedgehog-like way, the Shiltron was extremely mobile and essentially defensive, which proved fatal at Falkirk. After the Scottish cavalry had retreated, the four circular Shiltrons were significantly weakened by English archers and slingers, and then overrun by cavalry. The circular Shiltron's defensive capabilities should not be underestimated. However, it is not as useful as a tunnel such as the one a VPN establishes to protect your privacy in particular and the connection between your device and the internet in general. The best tunnel is provided by today's sponsor, NordVPN. We like their product because it is safe, fast and has gotten good reviews across the board. Nord encrypts your data with a double VPN, meaning that they route your traffic through two servers to ensure your privacy and security. Moreover, Nord is easy and intuitive to use. For example, you can simply switch where your traffic is routed through by clicking on the countries on the map. Their VPN is available for six devices and for all operating systems with just one subscription. And lastly, Nord was rated the fastest VPN in recent speed tests. So you're not trading security for speed. At the moment, Nord celebrates its 10th anniversary and offers an exclusive deal. Click the link in the pinned comment or description to get Nord with 1 to 24 months of subscription time for free. All of this is risk-free, as Nord offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. In contrast to circular shieldtrons, which were mainly used defensively, rectangular shieldtrons could also serve offensive purposes. There are only few descriptions of the formation, but two accounts give us an idea of how it might have looked like. The Vita Edvardi Secundi informs us that the men had axes as side weapons and spears as primary weapons, with their spears pointed outwards. They advanced like a hedgehog, or as the chronicler has it, like a phalanx. John of Krokelov adds that they used other weapons and shields as well. This description is suspiciously close to a Greek phalanx, and some historians actually argued that the Scots indeed had the ancient phalanx in mind when arraying their men in the battles of the wars of the Scottish independence. But due to the lack of sources, this is impossible to prove. One example for the Shiltron's successful use 
is the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. On the second day of the battle, when the major clash was taking place, the Scottish Shiltrons awaited the attacking English behind the river Bannock. When the English cavalry attacked, it failed to break the formations. The Scots then advanced and pushed the horsemen back towards the English infantry, still trying to cross the Bannock. This inevitably caused chaos. Many Englishmen were trampled to death or drowned in the river. The Battle of Bannockburn is deemed one of the worst defeats an English army has ever suffered. Similar infantry formations were also used elsewhere, for example by the Flemish, Welsh and Portuguese. Most famously, however, the Swiss picked up on this idea. All these medieval formations had a common purpose, coping with cavalry. The Swiss reached perfection at this art. The Swiss Pike Square, also known as Gewalthaufen, literally crowd of force, is sometimes directly compared to the ancient Greek phalanx. However, there are some significant differences. First off, it was a mixed formation. In contrast to the Greek phalanges, most of the fighters were equipped with shorter weapons, namely halberds, swords or axes and the like. Only the outer rows consisted of heavily armed men with pikes. Secondly, phalanges could be arrayed as widely as needed. That is, their front could be stretched according to the terrain and available fighters. The Gewalthaufen, in contrast, almost always had the same number of ranks as rows. An army was in most cases subdivided into vanguard, main body and rear guard, which allowed for completely different tactical maneuvers. Around the 1420s, the Swiss adopted longer pikes in greater mass. About a quarter of the overall strength were long pikes. This made the formation dauntingly effective against cavalry. When a cavalry charge was incoming, the pikemen, whether Scottish, Swiss or Landsknechts, aimed at the horses. Quote, For with the horse, the horseman is lost. But a wall of pikes was also a terrifying prospect for infantry formations. On the offensive, the Swiss pike square was capable of steamrolling charges. After the clash, the pikemen would step aside so that the more agile men with shorter weapons in the center could storm out and kill the enemy. Though extraordinarily effective, the Gewalthaufen was not invincible. In the Battle of Picocca in 1522, for example, the Swiss charged an army of Spanish arquebusiers and Landsknechts, who had dug in behind a sunken road and rampart. When they came within reach, the Spanish shot inflicted significant losses on the Swiss. After some desperate attempts, some of the Swiss made it up the rampart, only to meet the Landsknechts. The Swiss were nearly annihilated and were forced to retreat. Let's switch perspective. The Landsknechts had adopted the Swiss pike squares just before 1500 and improved it significantly. Now, the men with pikes made up more than 50% of a pike square and the square itself was stratified. Rows of pikemen alternated with melee fighters carrying two-handers and short polearms. In comparison to the Swiss, the Landsknecht's pikemen themselves held their weapons closer to the end, so that the points of five or six men standing behind each other could all be placed in front of the first man. In addition, as Reinhard Baumann, an acknowledged expert on the Landsknecht's notes, quote, Frunsberg, a famous Landsknecht's leader, apparently recognized the signs of the times. The future belonged to firearms." End quote. Not only did he recognize this, but he also put it into practice and consequently increased the number of firearms in his units. The first rank of a Landsknecht's regiment usually consisted of Doppelsöldner armed with pikes. The term Doppelsöldner, which translates to double mercenary, refers to a mercenary who gets double pay. These were usually heavily armored veterans, or fighters who bore more risk because they fought in the so-called Valorener Haufen, which in English is usually referred to as Forlorn Hope. This was a small band of men fighting under a blood-red flag. The Forlorn Hope was basically a death squad, consisting of criminals, Landsknechts chosen by lot and volunteers, which served to breach the enemy lines. 
from about 1522 onward. This was mainly done by the relatively loosely operating shot, which tried to shoot gaps into the enemy formation to create an opportunity for the infantry to attack. Not their most famous, but a very fitting example is the Battle of Jarinola in 1503. There, the Landsknechts and about 1000 Spanish arquebusiers defeated a force of 9000 Swiss pikemen and French heavy cavalry. When the Swiss approached the Spanish position, they were first weakened by the arquebusiers and then dealt the final blow by the Landsknechts. Jarinola is considered the first battle won with gunpowder in Europe and with this we are entering the age of pike and shot warfare. One of the most famous pike and shot formations was the Spanish Tercio. It dominated the battlefields of Europe up to the Thirty Years' War. The Tercio was an answer to a puzzle of warfare. Pikemen on their own were vulnerable to shot units, while arquebusiers alone could be ran over by cavalry very easily. The solution was a symbiosis of both, so that the arquebusiers could shoot at an enemy infantry formation and step back into the cover of the pikemen if a cavalry charge was expected. Thus, the idea of pike and shot was born. The Spanish were the first to put this into practice. They soon created a military Goliath described as, quote, exemplary for an era of military history, end quote, by the expert of early modern history, Michael Sicura. Created in 1534, the Tercio consisted of 10 companies, eight of which were composed of 200 pikemen, 100 arquebusiers, and 20 musketeers. Two companies were composed of exclusively shot units. So, in an ideal scenario, a tercio was about 2,500 to 3,000 men strong. In battle, the formation had a core of about 2,000 melee fighters. The gunmen were arranged on either side of them, in so-called garrisons, and four additional sleeves. These consisted of 100 to 400 gunmen and a handful of pikemen and halberdiers each. Over time, the overall number of pikemen and shot increased at the cost of other melee fighters. These smaller and more flexible squares allowed and asked for more elaborate forms of tactical deployment. An army was no longer simply organized in vanguard, main body and rear guard, but in a checkered pattern, the so-called Spanish Brigade. A simple brigade consisted of four tercios. A double brigade consisted of either seven or eight. The fragmentation of the army meant that the battle wasn't lost if one unit broke or was exhausted. For around a hundred years, the Tercio dominated the battlefields of Europe. Even beyond that, it remained a force to be reckoned with. But already, in the late 16th century, a new challenger entered the stage. The Tercio met its new challenger on the infamous fields of Flanders. There, the Spanish faced the reformed army of the United Provinces of the Netherlands, who had risen to fight for independence from their Spanish overlord, who wanted to impose Catholicism on them. In the Battle of Newport in 1600, the Dutch and their allies, among them, to pick up on what we said earlier, some Scottish and Swiss regiments, awaited the Spanish in a strong position on the top of a stretch of dunes. The Spanish advanced towards them and after a long struggle they made it to the top of the dunes, where they routed the defending English regiments stationed there. But then the tide turned and a series of counterattacks and cavalry charges finally made the Spanish infantry lines crumble. Soon they were disordered and fled the field. This Dutch victory was owed at least in part to the reforms Maurice of Nassau and his cousin were implementing in the Dutch army. The goal of these reforms was to be able to cope with the Spanish Tercios. In search for a more flexible tactic, these military reformers were inspired by the Roman manipular tactic. They hoped to reproduce what the Romans had achieved against the Greek phalanx nearly 2000 years ago, defeating a massed formation by making their own formation more agile. They deployed their men in so-called battalions each divided in five blocks of pikemen forming the center and three blocks of shot on either side. This way they had smaller, more flexible compartments, each consisting of one arm only. Additionally, they exploited the defensive potential of shot units. This way the pikemen's only task was to protect the shot. The depth of the formation 
could be reduced in favor of a widened front, which in turn allowed to improve firepower. The pikemen formed a wall, behind which both cavalry and shot could seek cover. There's a German saying of the time that goes, quote, In battle array, the most reliable help one can seek besides God are the Doppelsöldner, i.e. the heavily armed pikemen. As an additional innovation, the Dutch musketeers adapted and refined the so-called countermarch. In the Dutch variation of the countermarch, the first line fired, then went back to the rear of the formation to reload, while the second row was stepping forward and shot. With a depth of 10 men, the first row had reloaded by the time they were at the front again. This way, a Dutch formation could shoot constantly. In order for this formation to be effective, two conditions had to be met. Firstly, there had to be professional commanders, and secondly, regular drill. Every move was to be right, even under the pressure of battle. Nevertheless, battles were not too common. Because of the high stakes of losing a field battle and the high losses firearms brought along, the Dutch avoided battle whenever they could, and instead specialized in sieges. Just after 1600, the Dutch military reforms were brought to Sweden by one of the original reformers, John VII of nassau siegen There, it was further developed by the famous Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus. He further increased the number of shot contingents in his army and had his men drill so much that they were soon able to put up continuous fire even if they stood only six ranks deep. The new formation, the Swedish Brigade, was arguably a blend of the Dutch battalion and the Tertio, which neatly combined the advantages of both. In this new Swedish formation, the function of the pikemen was to defend the musketeers and, if necessary, slowly advance together with the musketeers and fight other formations in melee. However, it's controversial how effective pikemen really were whilst on the offensive. The famous German writer Hans-Jakob Christoffel von Grimmelshausen commented on the pikemen of his time, ironically, quote, And I think, he who kills a pikeman, whom he could have spared, murders an innocent man. I have seen many harsh events in my days, but rarely have I seen a pikeman killing anyone, end quote. The Swedish army demonstrated that it had successfully refined pike and shot warfare in several battles, most prominently at Breitenfeld in 1631 and Lützen in 1632. The systems of the Dutch and Swedes foreshadowed the more linear formations of the 18th century, in which the pike was replaced with bayonets. The bayonet replaced the pike's defensive function on the battlefield. With that, the pike and shot age ended, and therefore, this video. Thank you for watching, and please consider supporting us on Patreon.